Welcome to this Humanities Institute event. I'm the director of Ombrolio. And uh, it was really wonderful when Aaron reached out and said he'd like to do something on public trust. And we thought, well, this is, the, this is certainly a, a, a time for doing that. And there's been an incredible interest in it. Um, a few quick announcements before, uh, before today's event. Um, tomorrow, in this same room, we have uh, a panel talk on desert power. Mm. So and this is on Dune and Dune 2, which mm. is just out in theaters. And then uh, later this week, on Thursday, everything is not connected. This is on um, uh, critical theory, philosophy, post-humanism, and ecology on uh, questions of ecological systems theory relations with Kerry Wolf, and then readings and post-humanism with Kerry Wolf will be on Friday. <coughs> um, so if you're wondering what post-humanism is, Friday's event is going to explain that. Um, and then next week, um, we have difficult questions in the archives and the challenges and opportunities of building tomorrow's museum. So we have Liz Culver from uh, Colonial Williamsburg coming. So Colonial Williamsburg being a large, um, a large place for exploring questions of history. And because it's so very public, there are contentions around what constitutes history and how one reads their archives. So they'll be talking about that. So if you can join, join us for that. But right now, and related, public trust. Excellent. Thank you, I'm really excited to be here today and talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing. This is a project that we've titled Public Trust that's born out of a Fulbright experience that I had in academic year 22-23. And so I'm really excited to share that here. Uh, my family and I, who's here in the audience, uh, were able to travel to Norway for the full year and do some research on credibility, ethos, and trust. And then I Drag Jens Kjeldsen back with me uh, for this spring semester. We're doing some research on some things, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. So the title of the presentation online was Public Trust. We've got a little bit of a subtitle for you here, which is The Allure of Trust or The Allure of Distrust. And so what we're going to be talking about today is a little bit of that concept of why we, are, we desire the notions of trust or desire the notions of distrust in the United States and in Scandinavia. Today, what we're going to be doing, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the U.S. context, and I'll also then hand over to the, our other guest speaker for today, Jens Kjeldsen, who I'll talk about in just a moment, to talk about the Scandinavian context, and then hopefully have some room for discussion on the bottom. And so today's really going to be a thorough look at what public trust is in lots of different contexts. My name is Aaron Hess. Uh, as Ron mentioned, I am an associate professor of rhetoric and communication on the downtown Phoenix campus in the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts. Uh, more importantly, though, is our guest speaker today, all the way from Norway, who is Jens Kjeldsen. Uh, Jens is a professor of rhetoric and visual communication at the University of Bergen in Norway. We've been working together for about eight years now, and it was such a pleasure to bring him out, and I'm really excited to have him here to continue the work that we're doing. We've spoken together on lots of different opportunities, and I'm excited to do it here on the home turf, which is really mm. great. I want to mention just for a moment that Jens not only travels from afar, but he's also the grand award winner of the Cicero Award for speech writing in 2023 which is a pretty big deal. And his speech, which was as titled here, uh, My Father is No Longer Here, The Rhetoric of Eulogy. I really encourage you to go read it. There's a copy of it on the Cicero Awards uh, website. It's a beautiful speech, really wonderful. So welcome, Jens. We'll hear from him in just a moment. Today is about trust, which is a very complicated concept. Trust is something that we understand that spans across disciplines. We can understand it from a psychological perspective, sociological, anthropological, communication, rhetorical perspective. Many disciplines try to grapple with this notion of what trust is. We also understand it in terms of our technologies. So if you pick up your phone and you search for something that you trust, that the algorithm spits back something for you that's reliable, it's credible. We also understand it as experience through interpersonal interactions. If I loan Jens my car, I trust that he'll bring it back in one piece. And so we have these sorts of moments in these interpersonal interactions. We come at trust from a rhetorical perspective. And this comes out of Western rhetoric. And we think of trust as related to the concept of ethos. If you've taken your Composition 101 class or a public speaking class, you may have learned of logos, pathos, and ethos. Logos being about the logical construction of arguments, and pathos being the understanding of emotion in a speech, and ethos being about the character of a speaker. And so in the discipline of rhetoric, which dabbles in things like persuasion and public speaking, 
we look at the ways in which ethos is the constitution of a character within public discourse. It's understood from the Aristotelian sense as virtuous character or competence, like a PhD. Uh, by the way, if you came here for a public trust discussion about financial security in the future, that's not what we're discussing, I'm not that kind of expert. Uh, or we can think about this in terms of goodwill to the audience, and so these are the understandings of ethos. What is uh, huge for our conceptualization of trust is that it's dynamic and relational. I can't have ethos here necessarily. It's something that you attribute to me, that you look at me and you say that, oh, you have ethos because you have a PhD or you are speaking at this place or whatnot. And so it's something that we theorize a lot, is this dynamic and relational character of ethos. We're not going to talk that much about it, but we do have a large-scale project where we're theorizing an ecological approach to ethos. Hopefully we're going to have a book come out in the next year or so, as well as some articles and other sorts of works. We're working on an edited volume about ethos and technology right now. But today is not entirely about ethos. Today is about trust, public trust, social trust. So how do we conceptualize trust? Before we get too deep into it, I want to give you a bit of a thought experiment. So if you lost a wallet or purse that contained, say, $200, how likely is it to be returned with the money in it? Maybe I see some thumbs up. Oh, that'd be... Okay. This is a, a question that is asked frequently in trust research about how we make sense of trust and how we measure it. When we want to define what trust is, we're going to do that using Catherine Hawley's work, who's a philosopher. And she says that, quote, trust is primarily a three-place relation involving two people and a task. You may trust me to look after your children, to keep a secret, to, to, or to tell the truth, and that trust involves expectations about both competence and willingness. And so we think of trust between two people. We ask, can they do a task on your behalf? If I give my children $10 and I say, go to the store and buy some milk for us, are able to do it? Do I trust that they'll be able to successfully come back with the, the milk and maybe some extra candy with an extra $10? Does that sound good? And that measure of trust is both, are they able to do it, competence, and willingness, do they want to do it? So if I don't think that they are able to do that, they're not competent enough, then I would not trust them with that task. Simultaneously, they have to be willing, you know, wanting to do the task as well. <coughs> Holly continues saying that, quote, roughly speaking, to trust someone is to rely upon that person to fulfill a commitment, whilst distrust involves an expectation of unfulfilled commitment. And so we have that notion of we have expectations of fulfillment and the expectations of not having or unfulfilled commitments. And that's really the element of distrust. So keep those in your mind as we go forward today. When we think about trust, we think about it across three different levels in society. That it's something that we see personally. Do you trust your closest friends and relatives? That's one element of trust. Social trust being people that you don't know. Do you, people, do you trust people to bring your backpack back or your wallet or whatnot? And that question from earlier. And institutional trust, which is governmental, education, media, things of that sort. And so we have these different layers of trust that we'll be talking about. For us, primarily what we're talking about is social trust and institutional trust. What we want to do for you today is talk about trust across three layers of society, of how we conceptualize it, and how we think that we can learn something from each other from the Scandinavian perspective and the U.S. perspective. We'll be talking first about history, how does our national history uh, inform trust, culture, what elements of culture can explain trust, and then finally the question of the allure. Uh, how is distrust or trust an attractive feature for society? I'm going to speak quickly about the United States context because I have a feeling that many of you already kind of know it and then I'll give more time for Jens to speak about the Scandinavian context. Mm. This might be a familiar type of graph for you, that the idea of trust has declined significantly, and especially trust in the government has declined significantly over time. It goes all the way back to Eisenhower here, up to President Biden, and you can see this long decline in trust. We similarly see that in terms of trust in science, so another form of institutional trust especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. We see some declining levels going down here as uh, per the Pew Research Center, who does a lot of work on trust. We can also see this in terms of trust in each other. And this graph also as, you know, dips downward as we look over time, where if asked the question, uh, the number of people asked the statement, most people can be trusted, only 37% report that that's the case in the United States. So about a third of people believe that other people can be trusted in the United States. So why is that? First, we can start with our historical context, and I think that this gives us some ideas about how history informs the United States, and this, you probably can know where this is going here as we continue. That the history of the United States is one that has peppered throughout it many events, uh, powerful events in our history that speak to elements of distrust. 
the origin of this, this particular story in the United States context is one that includes the unfortunate slaughter and genocide of indigenous peoples, a legacy of distrust upon the people that were here before us. And that's something that speaks to our, our understanding even today. <coughs> if you go forward and look at the relationship between the United States and uh, the king, and this is one where we shrugged off the monarchy in a moment of distrust of taxation without representation, and so here we have uh, the representation of the Boston Tea Party. The same thing is true about the legacy of slavery, which also continues to this day in terms of the ways in which we see the, the treatment of individuals in our history all the way up to today, and we have lots of conversations about that as well. And of course, the outcome of that in part is the Civil War, which is a, a mo huge moment of distrust in our nation's history. Fast forwarding even more, we can look at something like the McCarthy era as another moment where institutional distrust starts to uh, trickle down into our interpersonal relations, where you have stories of neighbors distrusting each other because they're suspected communists. And so those elements of our history speak to where we are now in terms of our distrust. Culturally, I think there are other things that are happening within the United States. And so we can ask that same question, how does distrust or trust feature within US culture, or what cultural features contribute to our low levels of trust? When thinking about this, we're going to draw from uh, Hofstede, and Geert Hofstede has his cultural dimensions, and one of the things we can understand, if you're familiar with this, from an intercultural perspective, there are many dimensions of culture that have been studied across the world. Hofstede has a whole bunch of them, and Jens will go into a little bit more depth, but I want to focus in on two cultural dimensions that might help explain our, our affinity for distrust. First is the notion of individualism, this strong belief in individualism that is throughout US society, the me orientation, that sort of self-reliance idea that I am my own person and don't need to rely on other people, in contrast with things like perhaps collectivism or other sorts of attitudes. The other is the motivation towards achievement and success. And in the United States, we have this upfront drive to be the best, this sort of winner-take-all mentality that is a part of our culture. Now, of course, it's also the case that the United States is a very diverse place with lots of different cultural attitudes. And so if you find yourself saying, well, wait a minute, like there's different ways of making sense of this, uh, th that's probably the case. Very diverse place, lots of different uh, attitudes. But it is this persistent attitude that I think is both a, a, a product of and also a contributor to our notions of distrust. It does do some other amazing things in the United States. So it's not like distrust is all bad. We do have in the United States a sense, a, a healthy suspicion towards others, and that I think that this sort of cultural attitude leads us to things like innovation and ingenuity. And so I think there is something about the culture that is positive in that regard. I may have distrust because I want my idea to make it first, and the United States is very well known for that. I mean, in fact, here we are in the innovation central, right? And that's a part of our culture. Hmm. So the question then becomes, uh, in our landscape, what is our, our culture built by? Is it this historical distrust? And what is it about our United States sort of desire that is feeding this notion of distrust? And I think it is that understanding that we may actually desire it. This is a part of our rhetorical constitution, both historically, culturally, and I think in present day. When we think about the, the allure of distrust, we live in a media environment where we really feature the back and forth. We feature the MSNBC versus the Fox News, that we enjoy the cultural the polarization oftentimes in the, the context of our mass media, that these are the things that drive our ratings and other sorts of things. We also have other symbols of our distrust that are recent in our history. Of course, we look back and just recently, the January 6th, Insurrection on the Capitol is another moment where whether you believe in the election interference narrative or not, distrust is at the heart of it. And that's one of those moments in our recent history that speaks to the ways in which distrust is desired. <clears throat> in this election cycle, we can see that the persistent polarization continues with President Biden, who here decries MAGA forces and talks about the, the threat to our way of life and the, that the, the MAGA Republicans will take away all these sorts of things. Regardless if you agree or disagree, distrust is at the heart of that argument. And it's one of those things that I have a concern about when it comes to the understanding of our culture. So what do we do with this, this allure of distrust? Well, it is one of those things that as we look to the Pew Research Center, we can see that the statistics that they gather about distrust, it's hard to read this from here, but this is a list of priorities according to the US populace. And at the very second to last is American levels, uh, Americans' level of confidence in each other. The, le the level to which we trust each other. So not only is trust something that we struggle with, it's also something we don't care about. And that's where I hope that this presentation and these sorts of conversations can bring about a new understanding <coughs> of social trust. 
There is hope, though, I think, inside the Pew Research Center's uh, research that they've done recently, that they do believe, and the, the quote here is that those with higher levels of social trust are more likely to think Americans' confidence in each other and in government can be improved. So as much as this survey says we don't prioritize trust, most everyone who's surveyed believes we can do better. So with that, what I want to do is invite Jens up to give a discussion about trust in the Scandinavian context, because I think there are some lessons to be learned there uh, as we move forward. Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And um, thank you for having us. It is such a pleasure to be in Arizona and to be at Arizona State University. I'm really enjoying myself. My family's coming tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to showing them the wonders of Arizona and Phoenix. Um, and I think Aaron is right. We have to think more about trust. Maybe not in Scandinavia, where we're thinking about it all the time, but maybe here. Take, for instance, um, this gentleman here. Uh, many Americans seem to have turned against Fauci during the pandemic, basically didn't trust him. If we look to Norway, where I live, or Scandinavia in general, that was completely different. This gentleman here became probably the most popular man in the country during the pandemic, and he's the assistant director of the Norwegian Directorate for Health and Social Affairs. He became name of the year. He won a prize for clear language, and he became the public face of Norway. He even had a Facebook fan site. So that, I think, shows a little bit. And it was not just him. I mean, there was a high degree of trust in the authorities during the pandemic. First and foremost, the health authorities. As you can see here, it started out with 91% saying they, that they express much or very much trust in the health authorities. A little worse or not as good for the, for the government, which also dropped during the hard times of the pandemic, but still way higher than you would see in, for instance, the United States. So then you might ask, where, where does this trust come from? Because it is everywhere in the Scandinavian and Norwegian society. Well, like Aaron, maybe we should look to history. One part of history would be the civil associations and the state support to people in general or people in need that came sort of in the 19, middle of the 19th century. Take a look at this image here, for instance. This is the Unpolitical Association's National Day Parade. That's the National Day in Norway. Uh, in May 17, 1895. They're all gathering together, and they are um, working together, celebrating together. During this time in Norway, many organizations, many associations was created. Um, sobriety as associations, um, religious organizations, workers' organizations, suffragettes, so sport organizations, unions, and they were all working locally and working as a democratically elected. They were not always positive to government and state, but they were still supported by the state, and they even ga gained um, economical support. So there was sort of a working together that began at that time. And of course, the second thing in the, we can look at many things, but one important thing would be the introduction and development of the welfare state approximately 100 years later. So, ladies and gentlemen, what you see here is the welfare state. Isn't that wonderful? A man at home on parental leave, probably, kissing his uh, child. Now, that came around um, in the middle of the 20th century, 1956 to 70. We're still living in the era of the welfare state, but that was when it was created. And what's important about this, which is also what was important about the support we gave to people in need 100 years before when that began, is that here we got institutionalized helping everybody. Universal health care, free education for all, a wide social sa safety net, unemployment benefits that are pretty good, some say too good, Parental leave, I mean, in Norway, if you go, you get nine months parental leave for the full salary. I think that's different from what you get here, nine months, or 12 months and 80%. And the whole point here is redistribution of wealth. So that tendency to work together with people that are different from you, and perhaps first and foremost, distribute the wealth and make sure that you don't develop an underclass. That is one of the clues to the trust. And even 
The economists have said that this model may be the next supermodel, you know, distributing the wealth. So whatever your political view might be, there is a connection between this and trust. But of course, also, it has to do with culture. So what can explain the high levels of trust in Norway or Denmark or Sweden? This is Denmark, where I originally come from, even though I live in Norway. And this is a little shop where you can buy strawberries, potatoes, all kinds of flowers. So what you do is you just take something and you leave the money. I think what you call it here is an honor system, if I'm right. So this is one example. This here is me on a hike in Norway. So I got a chance to show you the beautiful, beautiful mountains of Norway. And this is my friend. And we lived in this little cabin here. Now, inside this cabin, there is food, a lot of food. It's not Michelin, I grant you that. But it is food. So what you do is you sleep there. There's nobody there. So you go in, you sleep, you know, you clean when you're done, and you take the food, and you write down what you've taken, and you pay for it. So this kind of honor system is many places to be found in Scandinavia. And it's a quite good symbol or symptom or sign of the high trust. So then you might ask, is this really the case? And as Aaron already suggested, yes, it is. So it's not only those anecdotal examples. We have surveys showing to a very high degree that Scandinavia is just one of the most trusted countries in the world. Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden um, are always on top of these surveys. When you ask whether you think you can trust other people, strangers, the social trust that Aaron talked about. If you compare to US, you already saw some of the numbers. So up here, you would have Norway, Sweden, D Denmark is even higher. And United States, like Aaron showed, is around here below 40%. So that's quite the difference, I would say. So trust, I think, I talked about it already. One of the most important explanations for trust, I think, and there are different views on this in Scandinavia, is the, the prevalence of equality, egalitarianism, and the welfare state. Look at this. I got to show you beautiful pictures of mountains and a man in his underwears. So as far as I go, it's been a good day so far. So you might think, who is this man in his underwear? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the prime minister. And prime minister, Pierre Borden here from 1969, was refurbishing his small agricultural farm because the king was visiting. Now, I'm showing you a man in his underwear to show you a very distinct picture of a country where we do not want to have difference between people. Everybody should be an ordinary person. And this would He's, he's alone, he's mourn here. Um, and research had pointed to the same. The American sociologist, um, um, Harry Eckstein, has says that prime ministers call, uh, cultivate equality more than primacy. We don't like people to be different. We should all be equal. You can say bad things about that. I'm not saying everybody should be in their underwear, but I think you get the point. He says when he studied Norway, and this was in 1966, but it still applies. The great thing, even among parliamentarians, for example, is to appear to be a regular fellow. That's what you want to be. If you brag, in, if you're Trump in Norway and brag about your, what you do, you, you're, not, you're frowned upon. You should not do that. So you have to be a regular fellow, practical and commonsensical, well-versed in dull facts. <laughs> Rather inelegant, unimpressed, indeed embarrassed by success. So we have to be equal. And we are, and we try to be that, and it has good sides and bad sides, but it's very closely connected to trust. So if you look here on the top left corner, you have Denmark, no, we can't see Norway because it's hidden behind um, Denmark, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and the Netherlands always follows the Scandinavian country, actually. So you have high trust and you have low inequality. So inequality and trust is very closely connected. And think about the dimensions that Aaron talked about. Hofstede is cultural dimensions. Now you would think perhaps that America is the most individualistic country in the world. Not so. Look at that. 
Scandinavian countries far more individualistic. And that may sound counterintuitive, even strange, but it's actually the case that in countries that are highly individualistic, you have more social trust. And in countries that are highly collectivistic, you generally have lower social trust. Because what happens in collectivistic countries or nations or communities, you stick with your group. And social trust, as Aaron said, is about people you don't know, strangers. So there's a connection there. Perhaps more importantly, here, this is the United States motivation towards achievements and success, and Scandinavia is very low. So this dimension, Hofstede is sometimes called the masculine and the feminine, and the feminine would be, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a good, it's, these are not good terms, but what he means is um, it's cooperation, nurturing, and quality of life. Or the other hand, if you're high on this dimension here, you would be uh, high on assertiveness, courage, strength, competition, and the other things that Aaron talked about before. So the Scandinavian countries seem to be more towards cooperation, nurturing, and quality of life. And just to you know, hammer the point in with a hammer, um, Bu Rothstein, a Swede, and Eric Oslein, an American, have studied this, and they say the roots of generalized trust, which is the social trust we've been talking about today, lies in a more equitable distribution of resources and opportunities in a society. Greater equality and less corruption, that's important. If you have institutions that are not corrupted, especially if you have a lot of welfare, right? you have to do it not corrupt in a not corrupt way, leads to more inclusive, universalistic social welfare programs and to greater trust. So of course, trust is in the institutions, it's in the culture, but we think this is what we're going to, to develop more. It's also in the rhetoric, the way we talk about it, the way we see ourselves. For instance, <clears throat> in the pandemic in Norway, the communication to the public was very different, I think, from what you had here in the United States. We had a rhetoric of solidarity. We all in this together. We had a rhetoric invitation. I didn't coerce or force you. I invite you to be part of solving this problem and a rhetoric of remarkable openness and transparency. This is our then Prime Minister, Minister Anna Solberg, the day that Norway locked down, and we really locked down, as hard as you did here in the United States. And she said, and I'll explain this in a little second, it is decisive, she said, that every citizen in the, in the country participate in a dugnat to curb the virus. I'll explain dugnat. We must do that in solidarity with the elder, the chronically ill, and others who are particularly exposed for developing a serious disease. Now, dugnat is important because that's a specific Norwegian trait. I mean, you would have the same here, but it comes out differently in, in Norway. It's a collective, voluntary effort where everybody participates. So if you go out and you... you I mean, in, I, I live in Garfield in Phoenix now, and we have people meeting once a month and picking up garbage in the neighborhood. That's Dugnat. We all do it together for the common community. But notice the rhetoric here. She's not saying, I'm the prime minister. You should do what I tell you. We're all in this together. Of course, if we fail, it's not only my fault. It's also your fault, because we're all in this together. Another trade would be openly admitting uncertainty and lack of knowledge. Here's um, the director, the Norwegian director of health, the boss of the man I just showed you before. And they changed their policies, right, during the pandemic. So the journalist is asking him, why are you coming here? Why are you appearing now and saying that we should strike down this virus? One month ago, you told us differently. They're changing the course. And he just plain out admits and say, yeah, we can only admit we are learning along the way in this pandemic. New knowledge is constantly emerging, which forces us to change the way we are thinking. So he openly admits that they are changing it. So I could have shown you many examples of this. We don't have the time for that. But I can say that generally, the communication from the political leadership and the health authorities in Norway was not to rhetorically force a course. They appealed through a transparent rhetoric, invited the population on board, and had wanted it to be a common endeavor of solidarity. And the important thing about this is that if you want 
as an authority, the public to show you trust, you should begin by showing them trust, because that works together. So we might ask ourselves then, if there's an allure, as Aaron said, towards the distrust, what's the allure of the trust? How is trust or distrust attractive for a society? Now, <clears throat> trust is not only a matter of a fact which can be measured, it's also a continuous consti constitution created by leaders, institutions, and citizens. We talk about it constantly. We are so proud that we are on the top of any list. Right? I think that maybe that's what people do. So here, for instance, this is the Nordic Minister, Nordic Council of Ministers. They even made a report calling it the Nordic Gold. So it's not just that this is happening. We are talking about it. So we tell ourselves that high level of societal trust reduce the transaction cost. We have other good reasons for why we should have trust. And that's not only in research and public reports. I mean, even in the public. For instance, here's a, a newspaper um, headline saying that Norwegian are the most trusting people in the world. Yay, we are celebrating ourselves. Even on television, here's a television program, which the placard says, why are Norwegian the most trusting people in the world? This is what we will find out today. So we're digging deeply into our own souls to find out why we are so good. <laughs> a Norwegian prime minister once said in a New Year's speech, it's typically Norwegian to be good. So you get the sense. Now, we didn't used to talk that much about trust until we discovered that we were on the top of lists. Now, here's one more of the, um, of the type of shops that I showed you before. Now, this is in Denmark. Now in Denmark, they've started calling it trust shops. I mean, before it was just a shop and you could take the thing, but now we are sort of talking to ourselves to tell us who we are. And that's good, of course, but of course, too much trust may also be a problem. I mean, the line between trust and utter naivete may be little. So one may ask, do we have too little trust in our relations and generally in society? I think that Americans have too little trust, but maybe for a reason, you could say. Or we could say, do we have too much trust, for instance, in Norway? And actually, two writers recently published this book here that's called The Blue-Eyed Kingdom, Norwegian Pathologies of Trust, saying that no Norwegians are almost sick to the extent that they would trust other people. And this book came out after a long range of scandals by, with politicians who have mit, misused their positions. So that's the question. Do we have too little trust or do we have too much trust? And what's trust like in the United States and in Norway? And we hope that you would like to discuss that a little more with us. Thank you. Thank you. Whoops. OK. So at this point, we're hopeful to have a discussion about <clears throat> some of the ideas that we're, we're tossing about. It's fine. Oh, that one's yours, yeah. Uh, and that we, we think that there's some interesting elements of, of trust that go into this, but we also think that there's uh, an interesting conversation in the United States that we don't talk about trust. Mm -hmm. And so part of the, the spirit <clears throat> of this presentation is to bring up trust into the forefront to try to to see what people think about it. And so uh, maybe that first question that I might have for you all is, uh, when you asked that question about leaving your backpack or wallet, how did you respond? Do we trust each other? I think that it's getting better. Yeah? yeah. Trust is increasing, so the likelihood is increasing. Hmm. But I'm here in the US. Sure, and how, so what makes you feel that way? Um, time, maybe age, I don't know. Hmm. But on the reverse, doesn't make too much of a difference. It used to occur to me, it has happened when I was younger, that people, that things were returned to me. Mm -hmm. On the reverse, I'm not sure it's the same today, but I'm a different person. Mm. Okay. Can I have more? It, it's, it's not more than, I don't know, maybe three, three weeks or something. I was in the Haydn Library here, and I left my phone with all my cards, everything. And I went somewhere else, and I came back, and was gone. Then I went to the desk and I said, so this is what happened. I lost my phone with all my wallets and you know, 
that's bad. And she said, so what did it look like? And I said, it looks like this. And she took out my phone. And then she said, could you please you know, tab your code to be sure that it's actually yours? And boom, that was it. So I think it also has got to do, I mean, if I did that downtown Phoenix, I'm not so sure. So not so sure. Also, the relevancy of what has most recently occurred. I recently returned a phone as early as last week mm -hmm. that I count. So there's hope. <laughs> as a similar story, when we were in Norway, one of the things that happened to us is my wife had accidentally left her backpack on the bus. And uh, same sort of thing, where is it? It's gone. And mm. I, we went, we were to talk to people around us, and the expectation was it will be returned. Like talking to the people at the bus station and whatnot, and bus drivers, they say, oh yeah, don't worry, just give it a couple days, it'll show up, just come back. And it was, I think that was the interesting experience for us while we were there, where it was, the expectation was already built in, don't worry, it, it will show up, and which was interesting. And that was some mm. of the experience of other Fulbrighters that were in Norway at the time, they said similar things about which is, of course, is exactly what trust is, because trust is in, as you said, it's an expectation. Yes? Yeah, so what anecdote, then a question. Um, anecdote is the, the lost bag made me think of a fight debate that my wife and I had. My wife's from Spain, and I was talking about a time that I lost my wallet. I lived in a bathroom at a Barnes & Noble, mm -hmm. and then it was returned, but the money was taken out of it. Ah. And I said, that was wrong. I should have taken money. She said, you don't know, you know, like, in her sort of conception of the world, it wasn't wrong because they probably needed the money more than I did. Yeah. Um, which I also thought was, it wasn't a matter of like whether we thought the wallet would be returned, but whether it was okay to take the money. Yeah. Right? And that felt to me like, and that's something that's sort of uh, symbolic of a difference, I think, sort of in our way of interacting. But the question is about sort of more socialistic, socialist countries, like the, the capitalist system in the U.S. seems to be the problem when you're talking about having a welfare state and we don't have a welfare state. And so... But any move towards a welfare state is attacked immediately mm. in the U.S., and that's kind of part of the reason that we have distrust, right? Like that's part of the division is like this fear that we're going to become a communist, you know, country or something like that. So how do we develop more trust if you need to have more of a welfare state, but any move towards having a more of a welfare state is immediately attacked in the U.S.? That's a question. Okay. <laughs> I can speak briefly to that. Jens can elaborate in much more detail, but I can tell you that living in Norway for a year and experiencing some of the lack of concern that folks had for basic things, healthcare, education, it, it gave them a sense of freedom that I had not experienced ever in my life. And that was an interesting sort of a part of that. And, and that Norway is very capitalist, right? Like it is, you know, they have all kinds of, uh, I mean, they're great in all kinds of business. And so like, that's the other side of it is I think sometimes we have this, in the discourse in this country is a division of capitalism versus socialism when they really are different things. And uh, business is booming in Norway in all kinds of different ways. You Just know, a few comments and then I'll... Yeah, I was going to kind of comment on that because my stuff is on capitalism. Sure. And as you pointed out, the Scandinavian countries rank at the very top of the distribution by the Heritage Foundation in terms of their economic freedom score. So you've got a very free enterprise economy that's working in, in Scandinavia. So it's not capitalism that's, that's the villain with regard to distrust. In fact, capitalism to reinforce trust because you'll only get commerce if buyer and seller can trust each other to deliver the, uh, the goods. And that, that's a very good point. I mean, we didn't... To talk about the Vikings, um, <laughs> so I will now. So there's one theory that says that that kind of cultural trust started with the Vikings because they were traveling and they were also illiterate. I'm not sure I agree, but here's the theory. They were also illiterate. So that when you do business, you can't write a contract, can you? I can just agree with you as a person. Now, if you're not upholding your part of the deal, there will come heavy social sanctions. Right? You, we will sanction you as a human being. And the, the theory is that developed trust. With regards to the, the Spain incident, it was in Spain, or I can't remember, but of course, if, if I find your wallet and it has $200 in, and I don't need $200, I'll give it back. <laughs> right? But if I need it, I like, you know, this looks pretty expensive wallet, probably rich people. I don't think they need that money. I'm, I think I'm having it. And then that we immediate returns to, we return to the, the issue of equality, right? So you can't have like fake equality. You really need to have a society where people are not in need in the same way. 
Um, but you had a comment or a question? One other thing about <coughs> privacy and trusting government. Uh, where does the thought of communism or social state or social services coincide um, with trust of the government in one thing, but really just having some sort of privacy? And does commodification really have any privacy in it at the same time? I just don't know where they, they, they intersect, it, it, it intersect with trust, um, the element of privacy at all. And, and That's so a good question. Say, yeah. I have like an expose. Do you think, do you, do you, are you talking about privacy as in privacy online or what kind of privacy? I think in receiving services or um, receiving something from the government, when we have inequality that tends to be more of an option for some folks that, have, that are in need, yeah. and it can be a concern. Yeah. I'm not sure how to, to answer that question, but I, what, what the research points to is that if you have universal benefits, that is correlated more with more with um, higher trust, but if you say we'll only give to specific groups, that tends to, uh, uh, well, at least as Eric Oslainer says, that tends to have less correlation with trust. Changes but was that? Thank you. It changes that correlation. Yes. That, it, that correlation yeah, so if I'm saying, yeah, well, you, we'll all give you a bit like a basic amount of money that you can live on, or, well, you don't have any money, so I'll give you, but you can just have what you already have. So, yeah, treating everybody in the same way seems to be correlated with higher trust. And again, as we pointed to, I mean, trust is good, but you shouldn't be utterly naive, right? But I, I do think we did studies, we did studies on the pandemic, and when we just look at the numbers, it's like, yeah, I mean, the, the government is king, we love them, but that's not exactly what happened. So when we do interviews, we see that people say, yeah, we think they're right, it's sort of a, um, um, they give trust, but they are also seeing, can, can we really trust? So, they, so it's not that people are actually stupid. All right, one word on this. Please. This doesn't need to be long. Uh, any research or what are the benefits of trust? Are people quite clear? Is there any research? And does it change across countries? What the benefit of trusting could be or what are the benefits? That's to me, it's, it's time. Yeah, for, 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 for instance, uh, business transactions go way down. I mean, the, the, first time I, the first time I was in court, the first time I talked to a lawyer was when I lived in the United States, right? So that means you don't have to pay a lawyer to make sure that the, 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 the contract is absolutely bulletproof. Because of course, trust is always related to some sort of risk. So, so less fear, and less transaction costs. But you, I see you want to say more, so please. That's it, thank I you. I would just, if you're really curious about the way they conceptualize that Nordic Council of Ministers, that blue report right there, they go into a lot of depth about that. And so, and they talk about the benefits to society, which is really, of course they're speaking from a, look how great we are kind of moment. Mm -hmm. That's a moment. But I think that they have a point. And to be so, somewhat recursive, perhaps it's, there is a language in linguistics to think about humanity's um, per, uh, perception of trust. Mm -hmm. Is it Certainly. complete? Is it, does it need to be reviewed? That's a good point, because most of what we know about trust are me, a lot of sort of surveys, but what we want to do is go more into the details of what you're given. And by the way, I think you asked, how, how should we, I can't remember if it was you or you, or maybe it was you, how should we introduce this in a society? And I think that's a very difficult question, because we're all calling about capitalism, not capitalism, if you say we want to do. But if you introduce something and it's a success, then that changes everything. Think about Obamacare. I mean, there was like, I don't know, 54% of the country and politicians just hated it, said it was something delivered from a dark place. But now nobody's really, I mean, maybe Trump will argue against it, but it seems to be working. So when you put in things that work, Medicaid, for instance, you put in things that work, people don't want to get rid of it. And I think there's sort of a practical element in Scandinavia yeah, it works, so why should we change it? And some Danish governments, there was a Danish prime minister, who wrote, he wrote a book before he became prime minister called, it was called from, um, I think it was called from social state to competition state or capital state or something like that. The minute he became, he did not become prime minister, he realized if you want to become prime minister in Denmark, you have to support the welfare system. 
Otherwise, you just won't get elected. So he changed. But there were many questions now, yes? I guess I had a question in a slightly different direction, maybe about how um, people relate to police or law enforcement in Scandinavia, that part of what's challenging with public trust in the United States is that some of us, some people in the U.S. don't trust the state very much because they mostly encounter the state when it's pointing guns at them. Yeah. You know, and that's, uh, we have a consistent culture in the United States of a very militarized police force that might be, in some European context, maybe not in Scandinavia, something closer to like gendarmeries rather than mm. civilian police. Mm. So, distinction between military and police in the U.S. is, at, like at least aesthetically, if not in approach, gets smaller and smaller. Mm. And it's sort of like, that's part of what's hard to build that institutional or public trust is like mm. if everyone's pointing guns at us, like... Why should we trust them? That's not mm. trust, that's authority. Mm, so exactly. It's different in Scandinavian <coughs> Most of my Scandinavian context about law enforcement comes from my mom watching Scandinavian police dramas. <laughs> so I assume that that's not entirely accurate. No. Um, that's a very, very good question. I mean, before I start talking about Scandinavia, I went to the Extra Innings Festival. Mm -hmm. And they had, you know, police there. And they were really nice, relaxed. I mean. So I, I think it's a story that has several aspects. I mean, you can't get away of many instances of police violence. Um, recently, there was an incident in Norway where policemen um, basically um, struck physically down on a person just like they did with Rodney King. And that was like, oh no, are we turning into the United States of America? And weirdly, at first, of course, because everybody saw the video, it's like, this is police violence. It's like no discussion. But these officers were also acquitted after a long trial. And everybody was talking about, what will that do to the kind of trust that you're talking about? But in the public, this is viewed as a single incident. So it's like the outlier. It's sort of the, the exception that proves the rule. But of course, if we get more of that, that will all change. I don't know if that was an answer or not. I'll just add a tiny bit that I think is also a part of that is the perception in the United States is, which I think speaks to what Jens is speaking to earlier, is this notion of a corrupt police state, that the mm. police is, the, the, the law enforcement is suspicious or is corrupt. And I think that that discourse also feeds into the lack of trust into it. And there's lots of other efforts in community policing and things to try to reestablish connection between communities and police officers to try to reestablish trust which I think is wise, but I do think that in our overall rhetorical understanding of all of this is that the discourses that surround these activities, uh, are, they reify them, right? They, they constitute them. Mm -hmm. So a, a large scale conversation in this country about trust in all levels of society, I think would be useful in that regard. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that these things are just discursively created. There is police violence, but we could also have a conversation about that in terms of trust. Um, I wanted to ask you about trust and localism. So, for instance, if you go up the line from local government to the federal government, you get a diminishing trend in terms mm. of trust. Yeah. My understanding is, I only have heard about the Swedish welfare state, so I can't say anything about Norway. But my understanding is that in Sweden, the welfare state is administered on a very localized level. And per perhaps that is something that encourages greater trust in the you know, income redistribution policy. Sweden. Could you comment on that? Um, it depends what you mean by localized. I mean, most of the benefits in Denmark and Norway, and I would say Sweden as well, are distributed from the state mm -hmm. and okay. not locally. Oh, okay. I th but administer. Okay. What about you know, like, like, when we were there, that the interactions that I had with the state was all kind of signaled out of the commune or Vestland. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was more local to that part of Norway. So that is true. So many there, interactions with people. To that, are there layers of government similar? Local, state, county, federal? Yeah, yeah. So you would have, you would have a, a uh, commune, <laughs> which would be the municipality. And then we used to have a middle, so which would be we, in Denmark now, they call them regions. And then you have you know, the, the state. So it's divided like that. And they're always quarreling who should do what. And roads are the most obvious example, right? Yes? Yeah, I'm wondering about um, uh, uh, racial and cultural hegemony. As we have, um, as more immigrants come into Scandinavian countries, 
uh, do you see tensions uh, that are both racialized as well as ideas of difference, cultural difference, and how that has um, affected ideas of trust? Absolutely. <laughs> the Norwegian countries are very homogeneous. So that makes a difference. Maybe we should have put that into the presentation because that's an important thing. So I think that's very important. In, in Denmark, we've had you know, a right-wing party, several right-wing parties that are very critical to immigration, especially if they're from the Middle East and they're Muslim. Um, now, in, in Norway and in Denmark, these parties have either been a coalition party or in government which would seem for some people, I don't know, either a little strange or even scary. But it's also a kind of showing of trust that then can show trust back. So it seems that in the end, they turn out to be sort of like other parties, more or less. Um, but in Denmark, when, when, when um, these parties were talking about um, what immigration did to Denmark, they would say something along the lines of, this threatens national cohesion. I mean, sort of a literal translation. And also in Sweden, because Sweden have taken much more immigrants than Denmark and Norway. In Denmark and Norway, they talk about Swedish conditions, which actually is a problem because you have much more violence from gangs. And these gangs are often from places in the Middle East. Um, there are also other things. but. And, and Swedes didn't want to talk about that. So that's what these parties on the right talk about in Denmark and Norway. They say, we don't want Swedish conditions, so we have to be very careful how we deal with immigration. So I don't want to you know, make any kind of political statements, but I, I think you can say for sure that there is a relation between how homogeneous or how heterogeneous you are in certain aspects. And that measurement is getting is is complicated though. So Robert Putnam yeah. has a lot of work on this, and uh, but even that has been challenged because of the way that it's measured. So uh, if you just look at countries with higher levels of heterogeneity or homogeneity, it doesn't exactly map out that in terms of trust. And so uh, there are some people, people have oftentimes assumed that that's the relationship is that the more homogeneous <coughs> society is, the higher levels of trust because we all look like each other, we sound like each other, and so therefore we just know each other. And, and whatnot, but that's not always the case, and so uh, it is. It's 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 complicated. And that's a very sorry. That's a very good point because if we think back to the individualism, yeah. right? I mean, we are no, no, we, no way Denmark Sweden very individualistic. So I think that that, that we all are very different is not a problem, um, as long as we we uh, are not doing group thinking. Group thinking, that's what introduces less and less trust. And I think that, like we, we could have talked about that as well. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, multi-party systems, right? So you can always find someone that you can agree with. And if, you, if, we, if, if only me and Aaron are trying to become president and I speak really badly about him, you might lose to, you know, might not want to vote for him and then I'm the only choice. But if we have four people, you think, I don't like Ian, he's speaking badly, so I'll vote for Ian instead. And you can do that in a multi-party uh, system. Yeah. <laughs> you had a, a comment yeah, or a question? No, I, mean, I had a similar question to that, but um, the other question I have was about the two-party system. But then another question I have is how, this is more for Aaron, but I mean, I guess for both of you, one problem that we see sort of anecdotally is the fact that the right, starting with Fox News, has attacked institutions. Like, like mm -hmm. Fox News attacked news, you know, like the news, like it said, like the liberal media, and now they're attacking education, like mm -hmm. universities, and like, I wonder how much that sort of targeted attacking of our institutions has to do with our lack of trust, in, not interpersonal, but our lack of trust in, in institutions. Well, I think that there is a relationship between the, ins the lack or institutional distrust and the, the social distrust. I think that's a part of that. You see that in the reverse, at the very least, that if you look at the, these reports, they talk about how so if you have social trust, that it supports governmental trust. But if you have governmental trust, if you trust that the society is working on behalf of everyone, no corruption and those sorts of things, that it does trickle back down. So there's a relationship there that I think is important. Mm -hmm. I do think that that's, that's kind of that allure argument, that allure of distrust is that, uh, I think distrust sells really well and that narrative has become really powerful. 
Uh, as, and I think that that happens in a lot of places. I wouldn't necessarily always pin it on a right-left sort of thing because I do find uh, this has shifted in the last 10 years, uh, especially with the pandemic, but we can think of an era where leftists were really hesitant toward big pharma. Like that was that was a rallying cry, like, oh, mm. big pharmaceutical companies. And then, then it became, well, they created vaccines that we should all take. And then suddenly the left is de you know, defending big pharma. And so like this, either way, the, the conversation becomes kind of an interesting moment of distrust towards something. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's where we go back historically and culturally this is a part of our narrative. And then I question whether or not that's having some other types of effects that I think are, are problematic. I do think that there is, a, there is an industry now that is going after the government and institutions in a way uh, that is often curious to me because if we pride ourselves on being a government of the people, the more we attack our own government, the more we're attacking ourselves. Yeah. And I think that that is something that we need to address. Mm -hmm. That's right. If we get rid of all, like all trust in all our institutions, I mean, and right. it feels that way. It feels like we're moving towards, and we're, we're losing trust, you know, in successive institutions. That's uh, right. With all this Pew research, how long does it come from? So. Yeah, and you can see that line goes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Ian, you can correct me here, but I think just some of the comments earlier about the sort of the capitalist motivation is that there's a lot of free market development in Scandinavian countries, but also with an idea of a basic distribution of certain mm. things like healthcare, education, and sometimes that unemployment benefits allows people to leave a job without having to fear poverty. And that's mm. perhaps part of the challenge we have in distrust is the concern of scarcity. Like in other words, mm. like a lot of economic decisions we make are about like, do I lose my health insurance? And yeah. we put in a, some cases of what an American version of a free market has a lot of employer power in a way that I, from what I understand, Scandinavian countries, there's a lot more uh, employee or worker power. Is that correct? Um, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the American system, but I think it is correct. I mean, sometimes, at least in Denmark, we call it flex security. <laughs> so that means security for the employee, flexibility for the employer. Uh, and also, um, we don't have a minimum wage in Scandinavia at least not in Denmark and Norway, I can't remember about Sweden. There's no minimal wage. So how do people get a decent salary? Because the employer and the unions negotiate together. So without going back to the old Viking argument, because they actually write down contracts, but you have to, you have to, if you negotiate like that, you have to show some kind of trust, right? And the government doesn't get involved in that. And what we do is we, we have what we call the, the the front workers will negotiate first. That would be people working in industry, for instance. And then the public servants will negotiate afterwards. So if the front workers get like 3 4% raise in salary, that's sort of the bar. So if I work at a public hospital, I can't expect to get five. Even though sometimes they do, because for years they didn't get enough. The same with school teachers. But that's the way it works. So it does require a certain amount of trust between the institutional agents, if you will. It occurs to me we have not checked Zoom for comments. Is there anything in there? This question from Lisa Stone Willardson. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm interested in the rhetorical aspect of trust at a social tone level. Can you speak to similarities and differences in the political culture in the US and Norway as they play out rhetorically? Thank you, Lisa Stone Billesen, who is an excellent researcher. So we are getting close to the end. I think this will be the last question. And I think maybe Aaron would I like to. I had two people talking to me, so I have to read real fast. So he can, he'll, he's, going to read your, he's going to read your question, Lisa. Yeah. Um, well, it's going to be tough, because for me to talk thoroughly about Scandinavian political culture might be difficult. Uh, I, mean, I would say that the. the similarities and differences. I do think that competition is so much the thrust of political culture in the United States, where I do mm. not feel that. 
And I mean, uh, dis discourses of winning and defeating and mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. I think that rhetorical framing of our political climate has been uh, powerfully uh, influencing our notions of trust. And so I think that's probably the biggest difference that I see. I don't see that. I, there are certainly competitions in Norway, but when I talk to people in our time there, I didn't hear people thinking that my candidate has to win. That no. was, you know, like this, like a winner take all has to be this way. And I find that that's a little bit more what I see here in the yeah. United States. Also, I think the stakes maybe feels a little bit lower. Yeah. I think that's a good question, and that's exactly what we want to do. We want to examine more how you create trust or discreate it rhetorically. Yeah. But thank you so much for coming. Yes, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. And